Uh, it's really an honor for me to uh, introduce Detective Sergeant Randy McAllister of, of the Cottage Grove Police Department. Uh, it's an honor because he's a student of mine. Uh, I teach criminal justice courses at Concordia University, and he was in my master's course in administration of criminal justice. And we've stayed in contact the uh, last few years, and he has many areas of expertise, um, as you'll soon find out. But he doesn't like to work uh, on Wednesdays. Uh, and this Wednesday is the uh, anniversary of Elvis Presley's birth. This is Elvis Presley's birth date today. And Randy always takes a day off uh, <laughs> to, to celebrate. So uh, he decided to come here to be with you instead of celebrate Elvis's birthday. So uh, thank you, uh, Randy. Um, I'm going to let him explain his topic. It's a very serious, sobering topic. I understand he was in Rochester yesterday on that tragic situation down there. I don't know if he can talk about it much here, but uh, his program is used to uh, address the safety issues of domestic abuse victims. And as we unfortunately see uh, across the country, uh, when there's a um, divorce, uh, there's court proceedings, and there are restraining orders, um, oftentimes people get hurt or sometimes killed in the process. So Randy's going to talk about that today. And uh, I believe we have a process here where if you have questions, we're going to write them down. Yeah, uh, I'll put some on the table there and just raise your hand yeah, if you want to Yeah, and then uh, you can just hand them down and then we'll feed them over to Randy in the last part. Uh, this uh, is being recorded, this, this meeting, so uh, and we want to be careful uh, about the content. Uh, and uh, if you have a question and you don't want to be seen asking the question, you can write it out on the, on the paper. So, without further ado, happy birthday, Elvis. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I forgot to wear my blue suede shoes. So, uh, so thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me, uh, Lord. I always uh, enjoy uh, the opportunity to get out to speak to community groups because the topic I'm going to uh, speak on um, really the only way we can stop this stuff from happening is if the community members are aware of what signs to look out for and how they can sort of affect this issue. So. Um, I can't remember what a, uh, let's see, that's me in a nutshell, um, I've been with, uh, just very quickly, I started out as a paramedic in Minneapolis um, back in the 90s before I got into law enforcement, so I've been with Cottage Grove now since 1998, uh, detective sergeant, so I supervise our investigative division, uh, just uh, retired, uh, I guess you could say retired uh, last month um, uh, as a uh, team commander for Washington County SWAT, so I did 14 years there, so. Um, it was just, I was, the cold weather and my older bones don't, don't work well together anymore, so I, I did my runs, that was good. Um, and I, my interests are really in the area of um, threat assessment and target violence uh, prevention and management. And just sort of a little background so you kind of know why I, this whole thing interests me. In, in 2006, I was um, a team leader on Washington County SWAT team. And I was a patrol supervisor that night for um, Cottage Grove Police Department. And I was listening to the radio, and I heard a call go out to the Washington County deputies for a, uh, a, a double shooting with uh, possible hostages. And being a team leader, uh, I knew that they'd call SWAT for that, so I headed up um, to that area. It's, uh, it was in uh, West Lakeland Township, which is... Uh, a very nice, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, sparsely populated, but a very nice home. It's a pretty wealthy part of the county. Um, and I got there, and I was the first SWAT guy up to the house that night. Um, and then eventually we made entry. Uh, long story short, uh, it was a Stephen uh, Van Kieran, uh, Terry Lee case, if anybody's heard of it. It made the national news. It was actually on uh, Dateline NBC. They did a profile on it. And then... Um, Extreme Home Makeovers, is that a real show? Am I doing things right? Um, they, they did a, a show on uh, Extreme Home Makeovers on this case because what had happened is Terry Lee was murdered by her former boyfriend uh, and her new boyfriend was also murdered with her. 
and it left uh, four kids without any parents because her husband had passed away tragically in a car accident five years before that. So um, luckily she had an older sister uh, in the Twin Cities who was a teacher, I think, in the Minnetonka School District. So um, they, they adopted all four kids, but they had a really small house, so Extreme Home Makeovers built a new one for them, which was nice. But um, as I started looking at that case in the weeks that followed, I realized that, wait a second, we should have seen this coming. The, the system is what I mean by we. Um, and when I talk about the system, not just law enforcement, but the courts, probations, uh, mental health, because as, as I started pulling up old cases dealing with this relationship, I realized that there, it, there seemed to be lots of warning signs and red flags that something bad was going to happen. And so um, I actually used the occasion of uh, my master's program to um, start searching the, the databases and pulling up journal articles. And eventually I found this whole, or discovered this whole new world called uh, Target Violence Threat Assessment. And so uh, Threat Assessment deals with any targeted violence, which is something, it's sort of violence for violence sake, if you will. Uh, it not, doesn't occur like during the course of a robbery or a bar fight. It's, uh, you know, your school shootings, your Columbines. It's your workplace violence, where somebody goes and maybe does violence at the workplace or shoots it up. Um, it's your domestic homicides uh, in, many of, in many respects. Uh, stalking cases are, are definitely target violence because that's all stuff that's thought out. You don't just happen to stalk somebody, you know, when you wake up one day. Um, it's a decision you make at some point to pursue somebody. Um, and anyways, as I was looking at the literature and the research, um, I quickly realized that um, there is a lot of research out there that says that we can identify high-risk situations and relationships, and we can actually manage them and reduce the chances of something bad happening. Um, and so that's kind of where, where we are today. And, and so in the context, I'm going to talk uh, about stalking too, and I, I don't think I shared that with Rosie, but that's a big part of domestic violence, and in particular domestic homicides. So stalking is always a huge red, uh, red flag, and we'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, just some quick stats. These are from 2011. Uh, 23 women in Minnesota died from domestic-related homicides in 2011. Um, I may actually need to stand back here a little bit and read some of this. Um, and uh, at least four of those were children. Um, and then we had one uh, male uh, kill. Does anybody have an idea of how many domestic homicides we had in Minnesota in 2013? Closer. It, it, it went way up last, last year. Um, the last time I checked in November, I think we were just under 40 domestic homicides statewide. Um, and actually, in 2012, there were around, I want to say it was 15 or 16 domestic homicides. So we... We more than doubled last year. I don't know if that's um, you know just sort of a blip on the radar screen or if that's a sign of things to come. Uh, but uh, clearly one is too many. So. And then uh, if, if you listen to the news the last day, there was um, a murder-suicide in Rochester yesterday, I think that was, uh, two college kids. Um, so that'll turn out to be domestic-related. Apparently they had a date the relationship. Um, the, uh, you can't really get to domestic uh, homicide prevention unless you start with just domestic violence. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm read this down here, so I'm not in the way. Um, the uh, I, when I was a new cop, I always used to tell women when I went to a domestic violence call, "Well, you just gotta just leave the guy. You just leave him right now." And that's like if you know anything now, knowing what I know, that's the worst thing you can tell people. But they really didn't tell me that in cop school. Um, the, the most dangerous time for usually for a, a female in, in, a, in a domestic relationship is when she leaves that relationship or when he knows she's going to leave or suspects it. So she may not have intentions of leaving, but if he thinks she's going to leave, it's, that's when the clock starts, so, starts, so to speak. So 48% um, uh, of the women murdered uh, in one study. Uh, were murdered in the process of leaving or shortly after leaving. So that's a, that's a big, uh, dangerous time. Um, and it's, it's really over 50% now. Um, nationwide, um, total domestic-related homicides 
with the female victims are anywhere from 1,100 to 1,400 a year. So there's there's quite a bit out there. Um, domestic violence homicides usually start with power and control issues. And uh, some of you have probably seen this power and control wheel. A lot of domestic violence advocates use it. Um, but it's a great little uh, graphic representation of how abusers try to control victims. <coughs> and typically, and I always use, I'll, I'll talk about victims as she and abusers as he because statistically that's the way it is. But it does go in reverse. There are uh, female abusers and, and male victims, although they usually don't tend to follow these sort of power and control uh, sort of uh, conditions, I guess. So um, abusers can use lots of different ways to control women. Um, it's usually sort of a narcissistic thing. I'm not a psychologist, but uh, a lot of your abusers tend to be narcissists or antisocial personality disorder, that kind of thing. Um, so they, they need to feel like they're in control of somebody, and they need to feel like they're in control of their, uh, their female partner. And so they will use uh, economics to control. Um, they will use threats to take away the kids. Um, they will use put downs, insults, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and they will try to isolate the, the victims, usually not let them see their families. Um, they may control who that victim sees if they go out. Um, I've had uh, one victim I worked with who uh, her, uh, her husband didn't give her any money, uh, would hide the car keys. They lived out in rural Wisconsin, actually. Um, and he wouldn't even let her go see her family members. So um, that's how extreme it can get at times. So this is just one of the things you should be aware of. Um, and obviously there's threats to take away the kids if you tell somebody. Or there's threats to hurt. I mean, obviously the physical harm thing is a big part of this. <clears throat> And uh, I always tell people, uh, how, do you, how do you know if somebody's going to be an abuser? Well, basically history. If they've abused in the past, they're probably going to do it again. And uh, the last studies I saw show that there's not really, there aren't really uh, good chances of changing the abuser's behavior in many, uh, in many occasions. So, um, you know, like going to, to uh, anger management classes and stuff like that may work for some abusers. But the bulk of them in domestic violence situations, it, it really doesn't do a lot of good. So um, what I w really want to get to is the lethality. Again, we had probably 40 homicides last year in Minnesota. Uh, we had one in Cottage Grove in 2012 that I dealt with. It was domestic. Um, she had left her uh, husband um, two weeks before the homicide. And... Um, he ends up meeting her at uh, right out in front of Anytime Fitness where she's working out. He ends up chasing her around the parking lot uh, with the gun, shooting at her, and eventually shoots her in Jimmy John's. Um, so that, that made the news. Um, I'm sure some of you probably saw that. But it was especially tragic because we had worked with this victim the year before. And that's what really frustrated me, and I know the parents felt bad about this too, but we had arrested her abuser. Um, the previous year in 2011 for domestic related um, assault and we sat down and we did the assessments with her and she scored really high for being at risk for being murdered and um, you know we we counseled her and said this is really bad if you leave him or if you get back and leave with them and then leave him again it's gonna get worse um, but unbeknownst to us she went back with them they moved in together in uh, an apartment in Egan um, and things, surprise, surprise, didn't get better. He was still abusive. He still had the issues he had before he got arrested the first time. And then he, um, he went and, uh, and, and murdered her. So what we found uh, in the research is that there are these red flags, and these are the typical ones we see. We uh, already mentioned separation. That's the most dangerous time for a victim. Um, a history of domestic violence, obviously. Um, that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, pregnancy, believe it or not, um, can be, a, it, well, abuse during pregnancy is a big red flag. So if your abuser knows you're pregnant and he's still willing to hit you, that means he really doesn't care. And that's uh, been strongly correlated with, with homicides. Um, threats, any threats in domestic relationships should be taken seriously. A lot of times threats are used just to scare or to manipulate, but a lot of times threats are meant. They're meant as a warning, a, you know, a, an honest warning that I'm going to kill you if you do this or that. Um, in other situations, threats really don't mean much. Uh, one example would be 
there's a big study with threats against members of Congress. Believe it or not. There's no studies for everything out there. Um, but uh, they found that if somebody directly threatened a member of Congress, that was a virtual guarantee they weren't actually going to hurt them. But in domestic violence situations, we always take direct threats seriously. Um, stalking, huge risk factor. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. Stalking is really a sign of obsession. Um, and there's a term uh, we use called pathological fixation in the business. And what that means is you're so heavily fixated on your victim that it disrupts the rest of your life. It disrupts your school work, your work life, uh, you, you know, any of your personal relationships. Um, many times you'll see stalkers uh, maybe get fired from work because they're so fixated on stalking, they can't show up at work on time so they get fired. I mean, it's just stuff like that. Stalking is really hunting behavior. Now, a lot of stalkers stalk just to scare people, but in domestic violence relationships, it's really, it's really about, um, it's really hunting behavior, especially if they're separated. Um, if they've, uh, if she's left him, maybe she's moving in with her sister, uh, and then if he starts to stalk at that point, that's a big indication to us that we got to take um, more uh, proactive uh, action uh, from a police department standpoint. So, obviously, access to firearms is important um, in the U.S. And I say that because most uh, domestic violence deaths in the U.S. are firearms related. If you go to China, they're not. They're uh, stabbings because China doesn't have a lot of firearms, uh, but they have a lot of stabbings. In fact, everybody remember the, the uh, Sandy Hook shooting last year at the school? That same day, there was a mass stabbing in China, I think 13 people, 13 or 14 people. Now, I think only a couple of them got killed, um, but there have been other mass stabbings in China where many people have been killed, almost like you'd see in a shooting type situation. So, um, the, the absence of firearms doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Uh, like I said, it, it depends really on the culture you grew up in. Attempted strangulation is huge. It really only takes 20, 10, 20 seconds to actually strangle somebody and kill them. Um, so when abusers use that as a tool to control or scare, um, many times they're just a few seconds away from going just from scaring someone to killing them. Uh, and by strangulation, um, Sort of the the, um, the statute in Minnesota sort of covers you know uh, blocking the airway or blocking your carotid <coughs> arteries, the blood flow. So um, our statute covers both of those things. But anything that stops blood flow or airflow, um, and you know with force to the neck, uh, would be considered strangulation in Minnesota. Um, uh, forced sex in in the context of an intimate partner um, domestic violence, extreme jealousy, and that sort of goes hand in hand with the stalking. I mean. It starts with being extremely jealous of everything, and your um, your stalkers are narcissists, but they're also really unsure of themselves. They tend to have low self-esteem, um, and that's kind of a deadly combination, actually. Um, and then we talked about controlled daily activities. So I'm going to kind of cruise by some of this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the tools we're actually using um, in <coughs> Washington County in particular, but we've also trained uh, Chisago County and uh, suburban uh, Ramsey County um, just in the past two or three years in the use of some of these tools. Um, and just I want to talk, this is the uh, danger assessment. Dr. Jacqueline Campbell is a, a researcher with Johns Hopkins University, and she's focused on domestic violence for the better part of three decades. Um, she developed the danger assessment back in the 80s, and it's been refined numerous times with uh, more research throughout the years. Uh, this is probably about the third or fourth version of it. But she's identified these, essentially there's 19 risk factors here that are highly correlated with um, domestic homicides. And this is male on female domestic homicides. Um, and it's pretty interesting. In fact, she's found that some of these items are more strongly correlated than others, so they're actually weighted more heavily, and there's a, there's a way to score these. There, the DVI is more of a general risk of violence. This is an assessment tool for homicide. So there's a, there's a big difference there. Um, but you can see a lot of the, if, if you can see, this actually yeah, is kind of small. Should I pass, or is this different? Yeah, I'm getting to that. That's slightly different, okay. but very related. Um, a lot of these things 
here are things I've already spoken of. So is he even being unemployed is a risk factor, actually. Um, but does he ha has the physical violence increased? Does he own a gun? Does he threaten to kill you? Has he avoided being arrested for domestic violence? So that would mean has he run from the police? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Has he avoided going to court? That kind of thing. Um, does he choke you? Does he leave, use illegal drugs? Um, alcohol and drugs are huge risk factors as well, just generally for violence, but certainly for, for homicide. Um, and then is he violently and constantly jealous of you? That's number 14. Um, so you can kind of see all the risk factors we've, we've spoken of. Um, so that's a danger assessment. The problem with this is it costs like $120 to get certified to use it, so it's cost prohibitive for most police agencies if, you're, if you want to get all your patrol guys trained. Um, so that problem was recognized. Um, and then in, in Maryland, the folks said, well, how can we get this information to the patrol level guys so they can do an accurate assessment for risk of homicide and it doesn't cost an arm and a leg because the taxpayers don't want to pay for all this. So um, over the course of, I think it was two years, they developed this in, in Rosie, <laughs> that's what you have. This is the, um, what we call the LAP tool, the Lethality Assessment Program. And, and Rose did print out some copies here. And this is not top secret information. This is stuff we're trying to get out right now. In fact, we've, um, in, uh, in Maryland, I believe most police agencies, if not all, are now using this assessment tool at the patrol level. But there are actually more medical care professionals in Maryland using this than cops now. They, what they found through research is that a majority of your female victims of domestic violence at some point either show up in a clinic or an emergency department for medical care. So they thought, man, if we can get a nurse to ask these questions or a doctor, we may be able to identify these folks a lot sooner and get them help. They also found in the research that only 4% of women who ended up getting murdered in domestic violence had actually spoken to an advocate at some point. And that's troubling because advocates get really are, do the bulk of the work in, in working with victims, um, you know, getting them help with um, protective orders, giving them counseling, and really just supporting them so they can get out of that situation. Um, so Maryland thought if we can increase that number from 4% to something else <coughs> way north of that, maybe we can save a lot of lives. And in fact, since Maryland started doing this, um, their homicide rate has dropped off precipitously in a good way. Um, and uh, they've had great success. And they thought, hey, this is working great in Maryland. That'll work great in other, in other states. So um, Washington County adopted this in 2010. Um, it's really easy to use, and I, um, I actually taught us uh, a chain of clinics in um, Minneapolis, it was in June I think it was, or August. Um, so they're all now using this as well, and really it is the more the merrier. Um, I mean, it, this is great for the public to know too. The way this works is if you, if the, yeah, just ask a, a series of 11 yes or no questions. It's really easy. If the victim answers yes to either of the first three, that means it automatically screens in as high risk and it trips a certain protocol. And we'll talk about that in a second, what that protocol is. Let's say your victim does answers no to the first three. So then you go down to the next, you know, four through 11 and you ask those questions. If she answers yes to any four of those questions, that also screens in as high risk. Does that make sense? So just one yes answer to the first three is high risk. Four yes answers to the four through 11 is high risk. So what happens when, uh, when, when they screen in, in Washington County, um, now that again, the, uh, the officer, the deputy will ask these questions. If it screens in, they immediately get the um, victim on the phone um, with a domestic violence advocate. And, and that really is key to, the, to, to this program. So they get the ball rolling with the advocate. They get the help they need. They get uh, into a shelter. Uh, they get help with uh, restraining orders or orders for protection. Um, all that kind of stuff. But what also happens at the same time is probations. Washington County Probations gets this. We have two probation officers in Washington County who are pretty much assigned to this program. So what they do is they, the probation officer will get this for them and see that it's high risk. And if the suspect's taken into custody that night, the probation officer will go to the judge the next day when that suspect makes his initial appearance in court and will tell the judge, Your Honor, this is a high-risk case for lethality. 
At that point, the judges have been doubling or tripping, tripling bail, which is huge. Um, they've been requiring uh, GPS units if it's really high risk, if there's a especially if there's a stocking component. So um, a, the GPS unit is just like an ankle bracelet. And if the person is able to get out of jail, they get that GPS unit on their ankle and they can't go anywhere near that victim. If they do, they get arrested. And if they get close to the victim, we also hopefully are notified soon enough so we can get that victim to safety. So it's, it's a lot of safety too. Uh, the other things we're seeing is um, they're getting uh, pretrial conditions put on them right away. Here, here's the way the system worked in the past for us. If we had like a misdemeanor domestic assault, we'd arrest him, we'd give him a ticket, and he'd go to jail, he'd post bail, he'd be out for six months to 12 months before a trial, and in the meantime, nobody's watching him. He's basically free to reoffend and reassault. Um, with this program, when they screen in now, they don't just get out of jail with, with no conditions. They um, get assigned a probation officer, they, they may have to do um, weekly urine tests if, if chemicals or alcohol are a component of the risk. Um, they may have to check in daily with their probation officer. It depends on how, how at risk they are assessed. So um, what we're doing is we're really watching these people from the moment they're arrested through the trial process, which is, is really different, at least for us in Washington County, uh, you know, three years ago. So um, that's a huge benefit. We're going, as police officers, and this is my uh, moment of honesty as a cop, is we really get sick of going back to the same <laughs> locations time after time and dealing with the same problems. That's part of what we do, but we get sick of it. We found that we go back to the same locations a lot fewer times now with this program because we're really proactively dealing with it at the front end um, and getting conditions on things so that there's no reoffense for, for domestic violence, and we certainly hope we're, we're preventing homicides. So, um, aggressive, aggressively dealing with these things in a proactive way also saves cops' lives. Uh, Red Wing, was it Officer Schneider? Lake City. Lake City, Lake City sorry, Lake City. Um, he was killed in a, what was a domestic violence situation. Um, I believe uh, the victim had broken up with the suspect. Um, but again, we see that stalking component. He had um, he had text messaged her over 300 times just in the two days before the homicide. Now, a lot of people say, well, those are just text messages. You're right, they're just text messages. But what they also are is sort of an indication of the obsession behind them. If somebody's obsessed or fixated enough to, to, to uh, send 300 text messages in two days, they may be obsessed enough to do something else. And in this case, he did. He went over to her house um, and uh, ended up killing a police officer. So um, we really think if we identify these high-risk cases at the front end, we're also going to save police officer lives, which I'm all for. Um, but And not only the, the intended victims, but other people around too sometimes end up as victims of the violence, you know, third parties. So I think it's good all around. <clears throat> so that's what we're doing, and again, Chisago County is doing it, uh, Ramsey County, suburban Ramsey County. Um, it's There's a major federal validation study right now for this tool. I want to say it's in Kansas and Oklahoma, so I'm not sure when that's going to be done. The danger assessment is found to be a very valid tool uh, with research, so it accurately identifies high risk for homicide cases. Um, and this lap is now in that same sort of, sort of validation process. Um, so in, in access to firearms, um, again, we're a firearms culture in the US. Um, so there's a lot of guns out there. So one, one thing we um, do uh, on these high-risk cases is typically the judge will issue what we call a, a Danco order, a domestic abuse no contact order. Just automatically it, there's a Danco order in place. And the judge will also issue a firearms order. And the firearms order says you got to turn your guns over to the police department until this case is resolved in court. So um, we are getting uh, some guns turned in. Uh, and they don't necessarily my biggest goal is not to necessarily have the police department take the guns, but get them somewhere else, maybe with a family member who is responsible or something like that. But um, we are dealing with the weapons at the time of arrest now, too, and that's not something we typically did. Uh, 
Um, how much time do I have? Uh, go ahead. Um, we are here till 11.30 or later. Okay, I won't keep you that long. I yeah, yeah and just, Don't worry. Uh, no worries. you can right. ask questions or you can write Am them. I keeping you from something else? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about Stephen Van Kieran because I think there's some good um, good points to take from this. This is Stephen Van Kieran. This, uh, he's in prison now for the rest of his life for double homicide. Um, this is a case I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. Um, and this is also the case that got Washington County looking at how can we do things differently. And um, I hopefully got the slide I wanted in here because um, it will illustrate kind of how the system failed. Um, so a little background, Stephen Van Kieran and Terry Lee both worked at 3M in the Maplewood, the, the big Maplewood mothership, uh, as they call it. And um, they had, um, Van Kieran was a very intelligent guy. I believe he was a chemist at 3M. I'm not sure what Terry Lee did, but she had a really nice house, so she must have done something. Um, anyways, they dated. And then uh, by 2005, things were pretty rocky. And we're not exactly sure what went on in there, but she said we're done. Um, and uh, she moved on, and she started dating uh, Tim Hawkinson, actually, and his uh, his son is a uh, police officer for Maplewood, so um, I had to give this presentation to Maplewood PD once as part of the Ramsey County training, and uh, I didn't realize he was in the audience, so it was kind of, uh, but he was really gracious about it, and he said, this is really, really good. I'm glad you're telling my, you know, my dad's story. So uh, anyways, uh, Terry had four kids, uh, two sons, two daughters. The sons were pretty young. The daughters were, do I have a, yeah, Taylor, 12, Tara, 6. Tyler was eight and Trevor was ten. Yeah, I guess I said it backwards. Um, but uh, their father was killed in a car accident five years before the homicide, so uh, they didn't have a dad anymore. Um, but uh, Terry was doing a great job raising them. Um, Stephen Van Kieran was described as very social, usually, uh, you know, playing softball and uh, on the work teams and stuff like that. No criminal history. Um, there was no criminal history for him. He'd never been arrested for assault or anything. Um, and this is an important point, because in domestic homicides, we don't always see any history of actual physical assault. People assume that to get murdered, well, he had to beat you up before, and that's just not true. Uh, in the Cottage Grove case I mentioned, the, the um, Jimmy John shooting, uh, she had, there was no physical abuse whatsoever in their relationship, uh, as far as we knew. Uh, she specifically denied it. Her friends and family said, no, he's never beat her. Um, but... He was extremely uh, mentally abusive um, and suicidal at times, too. And suicidality, we find, is a huge risk factor. When the suspect is suicidal, he's much more likely to be homicidal, too, in a domestic relationship. So we don't, we don't ignore suicide. Uh, we take that as a big red flag. So um, there, there are other crimes in this Terry Lee case, though. Um, in in uh, 2006, there was a burglary. Let me actually do this this one. This is a list of all the, the case the case numbers we had in our system with uh, with them. It really started in, uh, there was a property dispute between the two in 2005, and that's uh, August 21st. And I, I noted howling. Um, there's uh, a couple of researchers, Calhoun and Weston, who sort of termed the phrases hunters or howlers. And he said, you can tell, you're more, hunters don't, howl and howlers don't hunt. Hunters hunt, howlers howl. They usually don't mix up their two things. So if I'm stalking you just to scare you, you're pretty safe. I'm not going to kill you or hurt you because I my, my whole intention is just to scare you. Um, and then the reverse of that is true too. If, um, if I want to hunt you and hurt you, I'm probably not going to howl. I'm not going to I'm not going to send you know threats I don't intend on following through on because I want if I want to hunt you and hurt you I want to be successful I'm not going to telegraph my intentions does that make sense to people uh, it's just like we've seen in school shootings a lot of school shooters they don't they don't tell their victims that hey I'm gonna I'm gonna come to school on Monday and shoot you they may tell other people around them some of their close friends in what we call leakage behavior but they don't tell their intended victims so. Um, Kind of an important, important point. So then uh, in uh, May of 2006, um, 
Steven shows up at her kid's school, they get in an argument, she ends up slamming his hand in her car door because he won't leave her be. Um, a little more howling behavior. Um, and then in uh, May of 06, her hockey net ends up getting stolen from her driveway. Her kid played hockey. Um, now, could we prove it was him? No. But this is the important thing in stalking cases, is, is we're really bad at investigating stalking cases. Um, but we, we always think we have to prove each individual act for a stalking case, and there's actual case law out there now that you don't have to do that. If you can show this as part of a pattern, you can sort of bring all of those, those instances in. So maybe if we'd done a little more work on this, we could have actually gotten that in uh, you know, for considerations of criminal charges of stalking. Um, as an example, uh, I'm, I'm going to Connecticut next week to teach a class of cops uh, in stalking investigation uh, for the National Stalking Research Center, and they're, the, they're funded by the Department of Justice. It was, I was doing my, uh, my prep for the presentation, and I went back and I asked the state of Minnesota court system, how many times in 2012 did Washington County charge somebody with stalking? And let me tell you how many people are stalked a year. 6.6 .6 million Americans are stalked in the U.S. every year. If you do the math, that means we should have had easily 2,000 stalking cases in, in Washington County in 2012. Easily. And these are reported stalking cases because half of them don't get reported by the victims. So you're actually talking 4,000 legitimate stalking cases, but give, us the, give the cops the benefit of a doubt, only half of those get reported. So we're down to 2,000. 2,000 legitimate potential stalking cases. How many do you think we actually charged out? Zero. You're close. You're six. really close. Okay. Well, it's 15. 15. But 15 is pretty pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> so 15 cases out of a potential 2,000 easy, um, and only five of them were actually convicted. And, and that's what I'm hof hopefully doing with uh, some of the classes I'm doing with the Stockton Research Center. And, and that's not an indictment of Washington County because that's the way it's done around the country. In fact, around the world. Um, we're doing a stocking, uh, we're doing a study on a, a tool, kind of like the one you saw here, but it's for stocking. And we're doing that in Washington County. Um, and I'm administering it for uh, a Carl Roberts. He's actually um, a professor from uh, Australia. And he's probably the leading expert um, in Australia on stocking. <coughs> and he says this is the same thing. In fact, the tool was developed in England because England wasn't prosecuting stalking and people were getting killed and there's this huge uproar uh, over one particular case. So they developed that tool and, and researched it and said, hey, this works in England. We can identify which cases are going to be violent. Um, and so we want to, myself along with the Stalking Resource Center, uh, we're trying to bring that over to the U.S. So we're doing a validation study in Washington County and some other cities. So the, here's the importance of, stock, of charging stocking. For one thing, we can charge behaviors that would otherwise be non-criminal. What I mean by that is if someone smokes a dozen red roses on your front door, is that illegal? No. What if they do that and you used to date them and they said, the day you get red roses on your front door is the day you die. Okay. See how that changes completely? Mm -hmm. um, so I couldn't charge them for, really, for red roses. I can charge them for stalking, though, you know, if I build a case and gather evidence. But because that's part of a pattern of conduct that's gone on for a while. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as an example, um, we have a case in Cottage Grove. Uh, a gal, she's not divorced from her husband, but they're separated. And he's been doing things like uh, damaging their car. Well, the car is in both of their names. So technically, I can't charge him with property damage because it's his property. But can I charge him with stalking if he's doing that to cause her fear? You see, see how that kind of helps us get around some of those things that might be non-criminal? So the other reason for charging stalking is because it starts at a gross misdemeanor and goes to felony really quick. So a felony, by definition, is anything that you can be held in prison for you know, longer than a year, basically. Good morning, and if they get a felony conviction, they also have to get a full psychiatric exam. And that's really important um, because a lot of times mental illness may play a part in that stalking behavior. So if you can identify a mental illness that's sort of causing that, a lot of times you can treat that and you can take away the risk for any further violence, ideally. So that's, that's a nice thing. Um, 
So anyways, uh, Van Kieran, uh, then he left uh, beer cans in her mailbox. Could you prove that? Well, actually, you probably could if you did some DNA, but DNA tests take a lot of time to get back. But again, there, this is part of the pattern that had been going on, and we just really didn't connect the dots. Um, July 29th, so he leaves beer cans in her mailbox in the morning. He comes back to her house, breaks in, goes after her with two knives, tries to, uh, presumably, to kill her. Um, she was able to call police somehow. Uh, he escapes, uh, leads Washington County deputies on a high-speed pursuit in Wisconsin. He goes to his dad's house. Now, he's a chemist. So he had a bottle of acetone. Is anybody a junior, junior chemist here? What happens if you light a fire near acetone? It can go up. Exactly. He, being the, night, the good son he is, he actually uh, uses his, his dad as a, as a bunker, basically, holds them like this with the bottle of acetone right here and try to keep, tries to keep dad between him and the cop. And basically taunting the cop, go ahead and shoot me, we're all gonna die. And he, that's accurate. If, if the cop would have shot him, they would have all probably gone up in flames. Um, so anyways, they get him into custody, he actually gives up. His dad posts bail for him two days later. What? Yeah, that's what I said. Dad posts bail for him two days later, he gets out. And, um, in the in the next two months, he actually violates an order for protection. He shows up at the daughter's school. He's on camera. Uh, the um, police department there sent a, a citation for a violation of that, but they sent it to Wisconsin. Um, and then finally, on uh, September 22nd, he goes back to her house. He breaks in in the middle of the night and shoots and kills both of them. So uh, we made entry. Um, at the two girls got out, and they're the ones who went to the neighbor's house and, and uh, 911 was called, but the two sons were somewhere in the house, and at the time we thought, well, maybe they're hostages. So we ended up doing the hostage rescue, essentially, <coughs> and uh, we actually found them hiding in a closet in one of the other bedrooms, but uh, Stephen was still in the master bedroom with the two victims, and when we made entry, he raised his gun uh, at us, and uh, one of our SWAT guys shot him with a uh, rifle, uh, he's he's alive, obviously he's still in prison. So, um, but um, that's that's sort of the thing that got us, you know, thinking what can we have done better. Um, and again, this is a great case of stalking behaviors that are going on that we we sort of fail to recognize and take action on. I think so. Uh, in our defense, now Washington County is doing a much better job. We're much more aggressive with these things because of the lab program and now because of the stalking. Uh, study we're doing as well. So um, that's them. There, there's Tim, uh, Tim Hawkinson, who's their new boyfriend. He kind of gets forgotten about a lot, but which is unfortunate, but uh, by all uh, accounts, he was a great guy. He was staying there because the family was just completely freaked out by, um, by Stephen Van Kieran. They had purchased like a $10,000 ADT security system, um, which failed that night, obviously, uh, also. <laughs> so there was a big civil lawsuit. I don't think it would have stopped the shootings anyways, but um, so there's a lot of stuff that went on there. And so that's what hopefully what we're, uh, what we're preventing here. Um, you know, big impact, obviously something like this happens. Um, it's still, I mean, still relatively rare when you think about the numbers, but when it does happen, it can devastate a family, obviously, but then the community, uh, the cops, I mean, one of our cops, um, actually the cop that pulled the trigger, <coughs> You know, he ends up uh, leaving SWAT shortly thereafter. <coughs> and I don't know if it was all for this, but that's tough um, mentally on cops, too. People think that cops like to shoot people. I don't know a single cop that likes to shoot people. Um, we're humans, too, and that's uh, tremendously emotionally impactful on cops. And In fact, most, uh, I don't know what the stats are now, but they, when I was in cop school, it was um, if a cop shot somebody, statistically, they were retired in five years. And it's probably similar. So it's just it's really hard on cops mentally too. So a lot of stuff that goes on. Obviously, civil liability too. ADT got sued for millions of dollars. So um, just sort of this the sum up. Um, I I think lethality assessments are coming. Um, if they're not here now, um, I, the research is really solid on these now. These can accurately help us identify high risk cases and hopefully manage them more, be more proactive, use the tools of the system. And not just law enforcement tools, like I said, but 
advocates, mental health. Um, you know, most communities have some sort of mental health system or like a mental health first responders who may be called out. Um, we had a shooting in Oakdale last year. Uh, a guy was delusional, but he, I may have heard of it. He just, he went uh, next for a rainbow and started shooting cars and he killed a 10 year old kid. Um, he had approached police officers two weeks before that and said, hey, is it okay if I shoot the people who are following me? Mm -hmm. Who's following me? I don't see anybody. <laughs> That's a sign. Uh, I mean, you can't predict he's going to snap and, and kill people, but you have to assume he's at a higher risk to do so because of that sort of delusional, paranoid statement. So, um, you know, if we can get our mental health system to be a little more proactive too and working more closely with the cops, I think some of these cases of target violence can be prevented, hopefully. You know, in the world of threat assessment, what we look for is things like triggers and destabilizers. Um, the, the reality is that any one of us in here is capable of killing somebody probably under the right situation. Um, how many parents in here wouldn't you know, kill somebody to protect their newborn child, for instance, um, or kid, right? I mean, you fight tooth and nail. So every, you know, it's one of the basic premises of threat assessment is we're all um, capable of killing somebody, another human being. The question is under what circumstances and what are the unique, unique factors that would take this person to kill somebody. What they found in not only domestic violence homicides but school shootings and workplace violence is there's usually some sort of triggers. Um, a lot of times there's a lack of sort of support systems. Um, the accident signage shooting, remember that in Minneapolis in uh, the fall of 2012 now. Um, he was described as a loner. He was described as odd. He had zero friends at work. He had cut off all ties with his family the two years before that. And they tried multiple times to reach out to him, and he shut them out completely. Those are all um, factors that sort of go into the whole risk assessment. Um, if somebody had been able to see those signs and report them, and then we had a system that was responsive, maybe we could have prevented it. You know, it's, it's a tough call. But um, the, definitely those triggers in his mind. And the, the, the trigger, the ultimate trigger in that shooting was what? Anybody know? He got fired that day. Yeah, exactly. And it was the worst kept secret. I have all the Minneapolis reports. Um, it was the worst kept secret in company history because I counted at least eight people in the reports who knew that he was getting fired that day. <coughs> in, including one guy who'd only been there two weeks, so it's not like he was upper management. <laughs> there are good ways to fire people, and there are bad ways to fire people. There are a lot of things you can do from a company, from a safety standpoint, to safe, more safely terminate somebody. Um, and you know, one of those things is keeping it a secret so he doesn't ruminate on it for the week before and then go in there knowing he's going to get fired because he brought a gun with him. Um, there are uh, things like EAPs, your employee employee assistance programs. Most companies have those. Maybe it's just getting them into that system. Um, there's there's a lot of things you can do to reduce the risk, and a lot of big companies have really robust threat management programs that incorporate all those things you can do. Um, a great example: Boeing aircraft has a great one. Target has a very robust system, and I got to tour their little command center at their headquarters a couple months ago. Um, so there's a lot of companies out there that are really being proactive. The problem is it's it's really not, it hasn't spread out much to the the medium or the small companies, and Accent's a small <coughs> company, you know. So, so I want to know about everything that happens. Even if you work in Goodhue County and he shows up at your workplace, now you would report that to Goodhue Sheriff. Okay. But also give me a call because I'm the one who's going to coordinate that, and I'm going to call Goodhue Sheriff and say, hey, I saw that uh, I heard that this happened and he showed up here. Here's the background you need to know. And then we'll coordinate our response. Maybe I'll ask Goodhue to charge them. Maybe they won't have before okay. because it was a single isolated incident. Okay. Um, but if they know the whole background that happened in Washington County, maybe something happened in Ramsey County, they're more likely to take it seriously. In multiple studies, they found that relationships that develop really quick are much more prone to be violent. So if you meet somebody uh, tomorrow, and then two weeks from now, he's saying, hey, we got to get married, that's, that's a huge red flag, actually. Because do you really know somebody in two weeks? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a huge rest. That's that's not just a comment on how well you know them. That's a comment on something that's going on in their head. You know, why do they need to hook up with you after two weeks? 
you know, why do they need to be married? What's this need that's going on? Um, that's one thing. If you uh, write, if you read any book, especially you guys here, read The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. Um, because he addresses these sort of inklings that people get um, in terms of violence risk and they ignore them. Humans are the only animal that ignores their intuition. We minimize it, we try to explain it away, we don't want to be embarrassed if we're wrong, uh, we don't want to falsely accuse somebody. So we ignore our intuition. Every other animal runs away. The gift of fear is really about trusting your intuition. And it's not magical, intuition isn't magic. It's, it's your brain picking up on sort of cues in the environment that your conscious brain ignores. Electronic stalking is huge right now. There are so many ways that I can get spyware on his cell phone and he will never know. I can activate his camera on his cell phone, his microphone, without him knowing. Um, now, I can't personally because I'm not that smart. But I've been to classes where they told me I could. So um, the, the, there, you, there's so much new software every day. Um, there are apps for stalking. Um, that's the other thing with social media. You know, if you call, come to me and say you're being stalked, the first thing I want to tell you to do is don't post updates on Facebook over your location or Foursquare. Um, and you'd be surprised how many times, well, that's just my life. Well, okay, do you want safety or do you want your friends to know where you're shopping at? What are the statistics on domestic homicides and abuser suicide? Hi, a lot of abusers will, will do a suicide after the homicide. That happened in our Cottage Grove case, that happened in the Rochester case yesterday. Um, the one in, uh, oh, what, where was that? Eden Prairie, um, Matusa, Mandy, Mat Mandy Matula from this last year. Uh, she went missing for several months before they found her body. Uh, the day that he was supposed to show up at Eden Prairie PD and um, give a statement, he shot himself in the parking lot. That happens all the time. To what extent are the professionals in the clinical community, psychologists, counselors, etc., trained in domestic violence lethality? Uh, I would say very little. Um, in fact, um, you, you, just being a psychologist or a psychiatrist does not mean you're an expert on target violence in any way. Um, and part of what we're trying to do is sort of get more of these folks trained. Uh, we're partnering with uh, Canvas Health, which contracts with Washington County for our mental health services to actually do training on target violence. Being able to say somebody is at, in general risk of violence is much different than saying this person's at risk for killing that person. It's a whole different set of uh, risk factors. And unfortunately, our clinical folks aren't necessarily trained in targeted violence. It's a whole different ballgame. So um, hopefully that increases. Just as sort of to back up, uh, targeted violence threat assessment really got started with the Secret Service um, because they protect the president. Uh, they've done probably the yeoman's work in, in the research in this area. And they, you know, they really started, I think they probably coined the term targeted violence probably back in the 90s when their studies really came out. Uh, Los Angeles PD has a threat management unit. They started that in 1991-ish um, after the murder of Man, uh, Schaefer, Rebecca Schaefer. She was an actress. I don't know if you remember this. She got murdered in 1989. Her stalker showed up at her doorstep and shot and killed her. Of course, uh, Hollywood, a lot of money, so they have a lot of political clout, and they got a law passed in California for stocking, the first of its kind in the country. Now there's a stocking law in every, in, in every state. Um, and then La Los Angeles started their threat management unit. They deal with stocking and domestic violence. And only 30% of our cases are with famous people. The rest are with regular people like you and I. Um, so, uh, but anyways, they started this association that I belong to, the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, and it's been going for over 20 years now. Uh, I do the conference every year in August, um, but there's just been a ton of research <coughs> out of there, um, and there's, it's, there's cops, psychologists, corporate security, uh, school security, you name it, there's all kinds of people there, which is great, it's so multidisciplinary. Um, but, uh, you know, the psychologists in that group would tell you, hey, most of my colleagues who don't belong to this organization, or at least aren't you know familiar with them, they they don't know target violence. Ramsey County was piloting um, a, a GPS program with stalkers. Um, I spoke with one of their county attorneys, and I don't think it's gone that well. I think the biggest <coughs> problem is they probably haven't developed a way to screen in which cases to use it for. 
Um, so if they if they do that, it'll be a little more successful. And um, you know because not all like like I said in, in our tool, our research shows that um, not all stalkers are the same. Some are at higher risk to hurt their victims, and some are at lower risk. So we if, if for G, in terms of GPS use, we want to identify the high risk ones to get them on GPS. Um, see, there's a question about, um, can you comment on the fact that after estrangement, new partners can become victims and also stalk? Yes. Um, in stalking cases, the person most at risk for violence is the target of <coughs> stalking. The person second at risk is any other person perceived as being an obstacle to that person. So if you're being stalked um, and uh, you have a new boyfriend or girlfriend, that person could likely become stalked as well because they're, uh, they're an impediment to the stalker. So that's a big <coughs> factor. Um, uh, how do we get our counties, like Olmstead, Goodhue, whatever, um, just start the conversation. How do we get them to use a lab? Um, this is a new concept, so if they aren't on board yet, that's really not a reflection on them, but like I say, it's really new. Um, just start the conversation. Um, and maybe talk to your advocacy agencies. Hey, uh, I heard about this thing. What do you guys think? Um, I, I don't uh, advocate a, a blanket approach. I don't think everybody should do it the way Washington County does because counties are different, uh, especially if you go up to like northern Minnesota. There are whole different dynamics up in those counties, and their systems work differently. So you got to find out the way it works best for your own county. On average, it takes seven attempts for a victim to leave. So we, we say it all the time. We'll arrest the guy, and, and you talk to her, yeah, I'm done with him. I'm going to get an OP tomorrow. Um, and then two weeks later, they're back together. And I don't fault them. I mean, there's again, there's so many dynamics, uh, dynamics there. Uh, a lot of it's financial. Um, there's a ton of stuff. But it takes seven tries before a victim usually leaves. Okay, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.